That's what the Bible is meant to mediate. It's meant to draw us towards God in joy and fellowship and love and pleasure, rather than seeing it as this jumble of ancient texts by ancient people in an ancient language in a place I've never visited a long time ago. And I guess I've got to figure out this history book. Welcome to the Great Tradition Podcast. I am Alec, and I have an update for you. We officially have a website, and you can find us. We'll provide the link in the description for any of you who are interested in providing us with feedback or reading our blogs. So far, we have one. So, I mean, you know, not much, but more on the way. You can check us out at greattraditionpodc.wixsite.com slash thegreattradition. Again, link will be in the description. More importantly, I am excited to post this interview. We've been sitting on this one for a few months now, and it is exciting to finally post it. Two warnings going in. First, a little technical one. We were working out some kinks and ran into some tech issues. If you are watching on video, you'll notice a MIPS hap with our Google Meet call. For some reason, it said our session was ending and we had to restart our call. But most of you listening won't notice, so it's not a big deal. It doesn't take away from any content. Warning number two. While I think this is an incredible interview, and I've benefited from it personally, this is heavy stuff. We're going to discuss what the Bible is and how it is part of God's works in the world through the church. That's a mouthful. And some of our conversation may be hard for some listeners to track with. But let me say, as someone who has studied hermeneutics, the study of how to interpret written speech, uh, for the past eight years, okay, that Brad East's book, The Doctrine of Scripture, is by far the best book I have read on how to approach God through the Bible. He covers a lot of ground, and he does it well, and in a way that invites us to think seriously about what the Bible is why it exists, and what God wants to use it for, and what he wants to use us for through the scriptures. For no other reason than this, I suggest, strongly suggest, you listen to this carefully and think hard on what Brad East has to teach us here. Without further ado, here it is. We have here Brad East, who we are really excited to have a, an interview with. He's written um, a couple books, The Doctrine of Scripture, very readable Doctrine of Scripture in the church's book, which broaches our subject for today, which is the church and scripture. Um, he was a student at Abilene, Emory, and got his uh, PhD um, done at Yale Divinity School. Um but before we, we get inside of the academic stuff, Ian has a few questions that are, um, I mean, they're the most important questions when you're talking with a person. They're the seven um, deadly ones that every are on everybody's mind. So, Ian, you want to take it away? Oh, geez. Well, thanks for calling my questions sinful, but uh, we'll, we'll do our best wow. here. So, I just... Yeah. I... All right, so so rapid fire questions. I'm gonna ask you a question. You have like a word or an ultra short phrase, 20 seconds at most, uh, no explaining, no defending yourself, you just answer. Okay, sound good? Sounds good. All right, here we go. Question number one, outside of anything work related and family, what do you most enjoy doing? So the answer is definitely reading. Um, but since reading is part of my job, I will say reading novels and poetry outside Ooh. of work. Novels and poetry, cool. Is there a better fast food chicken sandwich outside of Chick-fil-A? No. Cool. Correct answer. Number three, uh, favorite movie or TV show that most people don't know about? So my favorite my favorite two movies are from their crime movies from the 90s. One is Heat, uh, starring De Niro and Pacino, 1995 Michael Mann film, and then Out of Sight, which comes a few years later. Um, uh, I would not say, especially the second, uh, I, would, I wouldn't say they are the most popular, but I would say many people have heard of them. So you could tell me whether or not they count. <laughs> I mean, I, mean, I haven't heard I of them. I haven't heard so of them. Count. So. All right. Question number four, socks and flip-flops. Is that acceptable? 
So I'll say no with an asterisk. You know, if you're a, if you're uh, if you're a, a dad over fifty, I'll allow it. Okay. <laughs> there you what go. What about Eric a dad Stevens? with an inner spirit over <laughs> an, an inner old man? Yeah. <laughs> I'll still not allow it. Actually, uh, sorry. Okay. Well, you have to tell high school me that that was unacceptable then. Uh, define good coffee. If it has caffeine. Okay. Are the Patriots overrated? No, because I don't think they anyone thinks they're good anymore. So Ooh. it can't be overrated if everyone already thinks you're bad. <laughs> Ouch. What food do you love that most people don't? So this is hard. Uh, I like pretty much everything. Um, but my kids really don't like it when we serve them Brussels sprouts. And I love Brussels sprouts. So I'll go with that. Mm. Good stuff. Those That's are my good. questions. Thank you. Did weird. I pass? Am I am yes. I a sinner? Yeah. How how does this work? You pass. Interview over. We can hit. We can stop recording now. <laughs> Quick interview. <Okay. laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is this is for all the people that our churches uh, know we're doing a podcast now. Um. No, no. Actually, we do have some serious questions. Um, and we're we're kind of wondering, um, what led you to the point where you wrote a book on church and the scripture. Um, where you started addressing these topics, which are extremely academic, but extremely practical in the way that you have. You know, most people don't get their PhD at Yale. Um, what what led you down that path? Yeah, great question. So I was raised in the church, um, and I, I was always theologically precocious. I had a wonderful uh, youth minister who started putting um, theology books in my Hand starting in eighth, ninth grade. And that led me to wanting to uh, major in biblical text as an undergrad here at Abilene uh, before, with, with the hopes of going on to getting master's and PhD degrees to eventually be a professor, which by God's grace happened. That doesn't often happen that way, um, at least in as smooth a way uh, as it did for me. But because I um, had this training in Bible and had an interest in Bible and was raised in a Bible-centered church. Um, those are the things I was interested in. But the moment I was exposed to both systematic theology on the one hand and on the other, uh, the great tradition, uh, I realized that this was not my questions were not new questions. I realized that um, there was a storehouse of riches and wisdom for me to plunder and learn from regarding these things. And finally, that the kinds of questions that historical critical scholars bring to the text are not adequate to the kinds of questions that Christians have and are right to have about the text, uh, because ultimately those are theological. They have to do with God. And so I sort of uh, shifted in my, uh, in my master's work and then uh, by the time I got to my PhD into systematic theology, but I retained both the object of interest and the type of questions I wanted to ask of the text. I was just now doing them um, from a theological vantage point uh, with a view to what the tradition has taught and practiced with regard to the text. So that's kind of how I made my way there with an interest in first Holy Scripture and second, the community whose sacred book Scripture is. Hmm. And so that's that's kind of interesting. That's a that's a similar path. I know a lot of people have had um, this path, and you talk about this in a criticism you have of the theological interpretation of Scripture movement, um, where we're dissatisfied with the way that we've traditionally read the Bible or at least that, um, you know, that historical, critical, we're going to read it, try to find one intended meaning of the author as it, you know, comes out through the context as much as we can do that. Um, and then we're going to, you know, use that as like the hammer of certainty to try to nail down our theology. Um, and... And there's a lot of people who are really dissatisfied with that approach. And there's a whole movement that's been sort of disjointed, um, trying to, to figure out how do we read the Bible so that we can actually spiritually draw closer to God. Um, and 
while you while you in your books you say man this thing has been really helpful um you say that it's pretty well ignored the way that the doctrine of the church systematically is related to the doctrine of scripture and how that impacts the way that we interpret the bible so like what normally happens is we start with interpreting the bible and then we try to say this is what the church should be from that but you're saying it goes the opposite direction inside of your book and and you talk about i'm talking a lot but you talk about three different ways of construing the church related to that um so i'm wondering if you can follow up on that maybe start with you know what what leads you in that direction um and what are the the three different understandings of the church that change our way of understanding scripture you can start with the two that you don't agree with first and then the one that you agree with most last yeah, there's a lot there. Um, yeah. Let me say, let me say a few things to try to arrive at the destination you're leading me towards. <laughs> um, the first is uh, it, it, you used a turn of phrase that was the right one. That and I'm going to pick it apart, but in a way that you agree <clears throat> with. Um, you said you know that uh, theological interpretation as a sort of quasi movement, as well as the argument I'm making in both books. Um, take issue with the way, quote unquote, we have, quote unquote, traditionally read scripture. And mm -hmm. I think one way for folks mm -hmm. to understand uh, what's going on, not just in my books, but in um, among many, many um, scholars of scripture and theological uh, academics today, etc., is questioning the we and questioning the traditionally. <laughs> because um, yes. the we, the we um, is often the presupposed or imagined we of uh, exegesis interpreting scripture is often the solitary scholar in a study or at most in a classroom or the lecture hall. Um, and that's not the right we. <laughs> that we or that I is parasitic on the proper we. And the proper we is the people of God uh, because uh, the word of God uh, is for and belongs to the people of God. Uh, it doesn't belong, first of all, in the academy. It's appropriate for um, the Bible to be an object of study in the academy. No, but that's not its native habitat. It's not its natural home. It's proper soil for it to grow uh, and be what it is meant to be under God. And then second, the language of traditionally. Uh, it is true, I think, unfortunately, that the rules, norms, and methods of historical criticism, academic historical criticism for the last 200 or so years, it could be, you could make it closer to 150, closer to 250, what have you. Um, but basically after the enlightenment in Germany and Western Europe and in English speaking contexts, you have the rise and then the dominance of historical critical modes of reading scripture. And that becomes in your language traditional, but of course it's not traditional. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's not the way the church has ever read the Bible, which is not to say that reading the Bible with historical sensitivity or linguistic sophistication is not how the church has read it. Of course it has. Um, it has cared about the historicity of the text, the historicity of the person's um, who wrote or edited the text, the persons who gathered them, the persons who are written about in the texts. Um, but to read them in a historical critical mode is the invention of a new way of reading. It's a novum. It's an innovation. Um, uh, and in certain, in certain important respects, it's a disruption in traditional Christian ways of reading the Bible, spiritually, devotionally, theologically, liturgically, doxologically. And so in a sense, I, I draw on those two terms because I think they're helpful entrees into um, my books, but I'm a very, very tiny part of a much larger uh, thing that's been happening the last few decades, which is trying to retrieve and return to properly traditional modes of reading the Bible as the church's book from the perspective of the we that is the worshiping community that receives and confesses in faith that the, that these words bear to us the living word of the living God. Does that make sense as a kind of frame for this? Yeah, I wouldn't say that you're, may, maybe you are right now just a tiny part, but your books 
I don't see, I see them being very significant. You know, if like, I, I've been reading a lot of Ephraim Radner, who I'm hoping maybe someday, if he ever hears this, will come on to our podcast. Oh, you should you should just him. email him. I bet he I would want say, to. We're would waiting yes. for a later day to do sure. it. But oh sure. my gosh. Your your understanding of the church comes prior to the doctrine of scripture, which is prior to the doctrine of interpretation. Mm-hmm flips this whole thing on its head. Because if, yep. if Ephraim Radner is right in saying that, well, historical critical understandings of the Bible developed as a reaction to church division to try and say why I'm the church and they're not the church. Well, because I can discern by you know a particular form of reason that this is what the church is because this is what the, the Bible says. You know, and then... Forget everybody else and all the million other confessions that are out there. I'm the right one. Like, your book fundamentally flips that on its head, going to all these, you know, three understandings of the church um, from these scholars written, uh, influenced by Karl Barth, uh, the German theologian, who is super famous for anybody who's heard of him. <laughs> um, Here, let me ask you, so let me ask really you a question. Do you do you take my because I want to under, make sure I understand what you're saying? Uh, do you take my argument to be um, coming along alongside Radner's as a complementary point or as a as a point that disagrees with his argument? I I read you as complementary. Yeah, yeah, okay. I but that both of us are trying to over overturn or disagree with the thing that he was identifying in the post Reformation divided church. Era. Yes, yes. Yes. Okay. Just making sure I, I was tracking with you. With without your book, Radner isn't as powerful because mm-hmm. for Radner he starts with the doctrine of the church, like, and if you don't buy that the doctrine of the church needs to be you know something you you s- sort out before approaching the Bible, then you think, oh man, this is silly, you know? Yeah. But if yeah, well, you. So- flip that on its head then it's just so your and your book does that it's so powerful so i'll say two things about that especially for readers i'm going to take for granted that not a soul who listens to this has uh, read you know for 600 pages of both books um i'll say two <laughs> yeah. things one is um one is uh you're representing the argument very well what i would add to it is um is a kind of like on the ground way of entry, which is which is um, uh, imagine you sit down at a table and you've got um, a Baptist, a Church of Christer, a Roman Catholic, and a Presbyterian. Um, I mean, it sounds like the beginning of a bad joke, right? <laughs> and um, you you ask them um, how to read a particular passage of Scripture. You know, what does it mean? And the, the thesis of my book is that at the end of the day, there will be some um, legitimate differences of interpretation that, that simply stand on their own two feet. Like they really are hermeneutical. But that um, often, at least often, maybe most of the time, those interpretive disagreements between people who come from different Christian traditions in a divided Christendom um, are rooted in um, prior disagreements over the doctrine of Scripture or bibliology, and in turn, differences of bibliology are rooted in differences in ecclesiology or the doctrine of the church. That's the kind of logical chain that often what you're doing to give a different image is you're arguing at the surface um, but actually beneath the surface is what's defining what's above the surface. And you have to go deeper if you actually want to get to the root or the heart of where the disagreement lies. And so divergent, putting it differently, like once again, divergent ecclesiologies generate divergent bibliologies. And then divergent bibliologies generate in turn divergent hermeneutics, i.e. modes of interpreting scripture and understanding it. And as you alluded to Radner's claim, um, 
in the absence, for example, of a teaching office or magisterium in the church that tells the laity, tells the faithful how to understand particular teachings of Scripture when Scripture seems to us to be unclear on its face, then you, you, don't, you don't live without a magisterium. You start using different magisteria. Uh, so one initially is... Uh, like, well, what does what do what do Calvin's Institutes tell us, right? Or what does the Augsburg Confession tell us? Um, uh, later, it, you know, it might be for the, like for the Orthodox, it's not just it's not just the Ecumenical Councils; it's the liturgy. The liturgy is the kind of control that functions as a kind of living teaching office for the Church. But later, in the last two to three hundred years, with the Enlightenment, etc., what you get is reason, and in particular, historical reason or historicism. And that becomes the bar at which you, you know, to which you bring potential readings of scripture. And from the bar, the judge, the historical critical judge, renders uh, some kind of sentence. Is this a good reading or a bad reading? And that's a way in the minds of folks who both developed and then followed this way of approaching scripture that was meant to provide a kind of common ground for. Uh, not just diverse, but divided Christians as individuals and as communities to say, is this an objectively valid way of understanding, um, you know, Romans 1? Uh, and the judge, i.e. historical criticism, says yes or no based on certain criteria and canons that are developed in the academy regarding historical plausibility, lack of anachronism, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And... Um, um, that's, that's, that's sort of one way of, that's, that, that's a, a number of ways of coming at both the question and the problem that Radner and my book and others are trying to address. And I'm not, I, I do end up making a kind of constructive case by the end, but largely what I'm doing is just trying to make a kind of methodological intervention to say, if we mm -hmm. at least want to understand each other, um, but prior to even persuading one another, if we want to understand one another, we should actually talk about the thing we really disagree about and not the thing, the superficial thing that is the symptom, but not the cause of our disagreement. Yeah, yeah but but I believe and this is this is kind of a tongue in cheek thing because I'm not a Calvinist, but like I believe that the church is a creature of the word. So really what we need to do is we need to start with. The scripture because the scripture made the church right you're saying that or you're embodying a view i'm i'm embodying a view and i was hoping you could talk about that understanding and then yeah. the other understanding that is kind of like our restoration movement church of mm -hmm. christ churches yeah um before getting inside of the final one which is yeah it's an interesting thing to say you know right after this you're going to disagree with the restoration movement one the professor at the restoration movement school with the yeah. restoration movement, people talking on the phone, on the Google. Um. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, I think I began my last answer with uh, wanting to say two things, and I never really got to the second one. So I'm glad you said this. I, I want to make clear that um, it's not meant to be a unilinear claim. I think it's um, it's not meant to be asymmetrical. In other words, um there's there's a reciprocal systematic influence that runs both ah. from ecclesiology to the doctrine of scripture and the other way. So that's the first thing to say that it's not it doesn't run only one way. It's not that ecclesiology mm -hmm. is is sort of the queen and bibliology is a subject. Uh, it's it's caught more in a web and there are nodes of the web and they run in all kinds of different directions. Um, okay. uh, for, so that's 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 the that's the the main the 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 a, a sort of supplementary point that's important to understand. Um, and that's true of every doctrine in 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 the the sort of corpus of Christian divinity, like. Um, um, all the doctrines affect one another. That, that's what makes them systematic. Um, <clears throat> and I'd say, in addition to that, uh, this is a this is a this is a um, a technical point, but it's an important one, especially for readers who aren't used to systematic theology or haven't read much much Christian doctrine. You know, there's a distinction. There's a fundamental distinction between the thing itself and the doctrine of the thing. So what I'm talking about is logical logical connections between human doctrines of the things themselves. So there's a difference between the church 
and the doctrine of the church, which is Christian theological understanding about the church. Um, same for God, right? Like there's a difference between God in himself, Holy Trinity, etc., and the do- the Christian doctrine mm-hmm. of God, uh, or the Christian, in this case, the Christian doctrine of Holy Scripture. And um, what I'm wanting to do in these books is to uh, show is to show the connections between the doctrines, um, which is not necessarily to to do the same thing regarding the things themselves. So to your mm-hmm. the you know if you're wondering how this relates to your question, if I'm talking to uh, a reformed theologian and he says he says east like the the, the church is the creature of the word, and I know you're not going to deny that. What I say to that is yes, the creature uh, the church is. Um, uh, the creature of the word. It's created by the living word of God. Um, but we can become confused if we speak equivocally using those terms. That doesn't mean the Bible comes before the church because that, or or like the canon of Holy Scripture precedes in time the existence of God's people because we all know that's not true. Um, the calling of Abraham begins the people the covenant people of God, and the Bible is not anywhere in sight. Um, Pentecost is the beginning of the new covenant people of God, or the church filled with the Holy Spirit, the body of Christ. Well, there's not a New Testament text in sight at that point. And even where, whenever you want to date the sort of last book of the canon, whether to 70, 85, 100, or later, um, even at that point, the documents of the New Testament may, may be written, but the canon, qua canon, doesn't exist. Because a, there has to be a church to canonize it. There has to be a church to say, here's the formal list of the texts that are part of the collection of the writings that we confess in faith to be, um, to bear to us, to bring to us, to mediate the living uh, word of the living God to his holy people. And so there, you, have to, you have to be able to say, you, uh, you have to be able to hold both together mm-hmm. at the same time, to affirm both propositions as true, that the capital W word of God, God's speech does create God's people, full stop. And even if you want to say the gospel creates the church, that's fine. Jesus comes proclaiming the the good news of the kingdom, and it does in fact create a community around him. And later from heaven, it creates the community, uh, the apostolic community, the early ecclesia in Jerusalem. But that's not the same thing as to say that the Bible creates or the canon precedes the people of God, because plainly it doesn't. So that's, that's one of the, those, those like very technical distinctions actually cash out in major substantive ways for understanding both the realities and the doctrines about them. So if I can try and simplify it, is that okay, Alec? Yeah, go Um, for it. So it's, it's not that the Bible gives us the church that, that, that we know what the church is because we have a Bible but that instead the Bible actually comes from the church. The church is the one who wrote the Bible. Yeah. Uh, um, And of course you have to have an expansive or at least clearly defined um, meaning to both terms. What do you mean by Bible and what do you mean by church? Right? So another way to put it, another way to, to phrase what you said is um, um, the word of God written uh, Mm -hmm. has its source in the people of God. Um, so that the people of God across centuries and millennia write, edit, transmit, use, collect, preserve, canonize, republish uh, the Word of God, um, the, the Word of God written. Um, so in that sense, we, and then we can simplify that down to say the church is the human author of the Bible or the canon, or what have you. So yeah, that, I would say we have to, and there's this anxiety among mm-hmm. certain Christians, I would say, especially uh, uh, Protestant groups that have, have strong ties to the Magisterial Reformation, that to say, to say that the church is the, is the source, even the human source of scripture, mm-hmm. is, is like, as my wife's family would say, like they get wiggly eels in their tummies, you know? Like, it's well, like I mean, that, I that was actually gonna be a follow-up question that I, that I asked, like it might sound silly. You were gonna you ask about the wiggly eels? Yeah, everyone wants to know about the Wiggly Eels. No. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> sounds so, like an Australian band. Like, that's so cool. That does sound like an Australian band. <laughs> that's, a, that's a weird connection, but I agree with that. Um, 
No, it, it might sound like a silly question at first, but I, I think you expressed that there is this potential anxiety among, among evangelicals. And I, I think some of us might ask, okay, well, well, I'm a part of the church. According to your argument, does that mean that I can write scripture? <laughs> yeah, that, no. Answer is no. Good. But this is where this is where this is where talking about the church as the author or as the source is helpful because obviously there's a finite number of folks uh, who are all dead, who are all long, long dead, um, who literally wrote uh, the Bible. And you could and feel you know even if you wanted to add in sort of uh, editors, redactors, um, synthesizers. Um, you still have got a pretty finite group of people. I, I don't know. It'd be interesting actually to think about um, how many people we think were involved in those particular activities, but it's certainly, it's, it's fewer than a thousand. Maybe it's 50 to a hundred, maybe a few hundred, 500. I don't know. Um, but it's a finite number and they're all dead. So no, you, neither you nor I, nor anyone living today can write scripture, but it's, it's understanding the church in two important respects. One, well, it's understanding the church in one re important respect and the Bible in another important respect. The, the church, as uh, what Jensen would call the diachronic people of God, the one, the one people of God from, eight, from Abraham to the coming of Christ. <laughs> that, like, that's who we're talking about. Uh, we're not talking about only the church militant at this moment in time. It's uh, it's it's self evidently true that no one from the church, the global church in 2022, wrote the Bible. Um, but we're talking about the church, the covenant people of God, the people, the the family of Abraham. So that's another way to put it. The family of Abraham is the human source, uh, or the the proximate or human source of the word of God written. But then the second uh, thing we have to say is. What do we mean to be a source or an author? Um, this is where we, I think we have to expand what it means, because often we have this image, which sometimes it's a literal image from a painting uh, or some kind of artistic rendering where we've got a biblical uh, writer, pen in hand, Holy Spirit whispering in one ear, eyes kind of rolled up, see the whites of the eyes, in effect dictating, the Spirit dictating to uh, the writer who is sort of transcribing what the spirit wants him to say. And usually in the tradition, um, that's actually not how it's imagined, but occasionally you do get descriptions. Like I'm thinking of, um, the Lutheran scholastic, uh, in the early 17th century, um, Gerhard, uh, he, he, he uses the language of like control, um, that the spirit is in effect controlling the, the author. And if that's the way we think, then like, yeah, there's like, you know, uh, a few dozen writers and and they all took down the dictation of the spirit and that's that and then like the next day they put it all in a book and we're good to go and and the, the church is sort of set from the beginning and that 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 as as anybody who thinks about it for 10 seconds knows that's not actually how, the way it worked it's not the way that inspiration worked as the church is long affirmed but it's also not the way that the development and formation of the canon worked uh which took centuries and centuries of time uh and this is where this is where we can say the church is the source because it's not just that the prophets and apostles uh who were the principal authors of the text that became the canon of scripture um, were members of god's people so in that sense god's people quote unquote wrote the bible but it took the whole church uh untold thousands maybe tens of thousands maybe hundreds of thousands to do all the things i said a moment ago because the the, the formation of scripture involves preservation transmission liturgical use collection canonization etc 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 and in that sense the 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 canon of holy scripture comes from the people of god but also there's a continuing role for god's people not only to continue to translate it but to continue to use and receive and interpret it and to pass it along um to pass it along over uh, across time across the centuries not only to our children and grandchildren but to untold generations to come okay so that actually leads into um some some stuff from your book the doctrine of scripture that i wanted to talk about so when you're talking about the source you say that the the source of scripture is the word and and you describe that as um Christ and prophecy you make the point that the bible doesn't comment on itself and that the canon is at least functionally closed um 
I was reading reading a different scholar from. Uh, he's actually a teacher at Johnson. Joseph Gordon um, wrote Divine Scripture and Human Understanding, and he has a really large chapter where he kind of um, seems to challenge the point that the Bible has been closed, talking about like, you know, there have been different um, renderings of what the books of Scripture are throughout the tradition of the church. So I'm I'm kind of curious when you say the canon is closed inside of your work, and that was a point that you were just broaching. Um, what do you mean by that? And what is the canon? <clears throat> yeah, that's the right question to ask, especially in light of uh, church division. So I think there's a theological, there, there, there are three, three issues here. I think I'll focus on two of them. One is theological, one is historical, and one is ecclesial. Theologically speaking, um, it seems to me patent that the the canon is and must be closed um that is um ordinary folks in the pews um it it is um it is incumbent upon the church's leaders particularly uh in the church's liturgy and in the church's teaching to provide clarity and confidence for ordinary believers to say of the Bible, this is the word of the Lord. The, the, the Lord has spoken to us on this day, whether from, uh, whether in the context of the liturgy or in daily devotional. Not, I sure hope that this is, gonna, that this is still part of Scripture in 500 years, but I guess they might cut it out, right? That, that's, not gonna, that's not gonna cut it. Um, uh, and it doesn't, and the, the, from the other direction, uh, you have to say the same thing, that we're not going to discover um, texts that are part of God's word, but that, we, that the church has just been ignorant of for 2,000 years. Um, you know, if we if we dug up Third Corinthians tomorrow, and everyone the world over agreed that it came from Paul, um, obviously Paul wrote many letters to Corinth, and this is one of them. It's not part of the canon. I think Luke Timothy Johnson makes the simplest and most direct argument about this, a theological argument, that for the canon, and canon comes from the Greek both for list and for measure or ruler or judge for it to function right if you have one ruler that is 12 inches and one ruler that is 13 inches then and you put them next to something uh they're not going to tell you the same thing right like you you have to have the same measurement <laughs> um they have and and the, the the i use this metaphor with my students that the canon you use the canon to measure um either speech or practice and what it measures is whether this is up to the measure of the gospel, up to the measure of Christ. But if you have a bunch of different measures, then it actually isn't going to tell you the same thing. You're using different measurements, um, different rulers or judges. And so theologically speaking, the canon uh, must be closed. I think that's a theological claim. Uh, and I actually take it for granted that that is the mainstream teaching of the church, including across church divisions. Um, hmm. um, while there are occasional voices that suggest that in principle it's open, Bart says this, I think he's wrong. I don't think he's representative. Okay, so that's the theological claim. Then his, the historical claim and ecclesial claim come along, which is historically, um, while the canon, I think it's fair to say that it was functionally closed in the Middle Ages, East and West, although there was always some a measure of debate on the margins, that um, Trent is when the Catholic Church finally, formally and magisterially closes the canon, says these documents, not others, nothing can be added, nothing can be taken away. And then uh, the Protestant reformers also make similar claims, albeit with less mm -hmm. magisterial authority or heft. Um, and and the you see the Orthodox Church doing something uh, similar. We have a letter of Dasitheus, uh, I think this is in the um, early to mid 1600s, but though uh, don't quote me on on that. But he he gives a he gives a list of uh, a canonical list, and it's basically the same as as Trent's. Um, but of course, so we have a, a historical fact, historical nuance and complexity that. Uh, complicates the theological claim and then turns us to the ecclesial claim, which is mm. in the state of a divided church, uh, divided communions have um, divided canons. They have different canonical lists. 
Um, and in the same way that um, we are right to say the church must be one, and yet it is not, <laughs> to again, to revert to Bard, it's a kind of um, impossible possibility. Um, it, is a, it is a fundamental problem um, that different Christian communions have different canons. Uh, I think theologically it's intolerable, and in the same way that division in the body of Christ is intolerable, and it should be number one on the list of things for uh, the communions to be working on as they try to uh, work towards um, unity. So that's an explanation of what it means when I what I mean when I say that the church is or must be closed. I mean the canon is or must be closed, even as of course I have to admit that um, Catholics and Calvinists and the Ethiopic Church and the Orthodox don't all have the same canon. That that's a problem. I think it really goes to the heart of the gospel, like to the credibility of Christian teaching. Because if we don't have the same set of texts uh, that we confess is the means by which God speaks to us, then that 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 cuts to the very foundations of our of of our ability to say that this is true um, and reliable. And so it's just a problem. It's a problem. I think it's a problem for everyone. <laughs> um, I guess maybe it's not a problem for Rome since they think since they have sort of grounds to say why the rest of us are wrong. Um, but I think it's it's a it's a problem as long as the church is divided that the canons are divided as well. Mm. So this is actually, and I I I've got Ephraim Radner inside of my head. And there's this part of me that just, I, I've been so impacted by his understanding of what the church is that I want to like chase that down. But with, with that in mind and knowing that I'm pausing on that a little bit, um, let me ask the question, what if the church was fatally wrong? So About. like, like I'm kind of getting at your, um, radical reformation, you know, uh, understanding inside of your book, the John Howard Yoder, the um, great apostasy. You know, what if there came a point where the church was fatally wrong, and what if that fatal wrongness included, you know, affirming the wrong scriptures? Yeah, I'll give you a simple. So, that, so I've been giving long-winded answers. I'll give you a very, stri- a very simple, short answer. If the church was fatally wrong about that, then we should all cease being Christians. Like, like the, the game is up. <laughs> uh, in the uh, of all of all people, the world over, we should be pitied the most. Um, uh, which is what Paul says in First Corinthians fifteen about if Christ wasn't truly raised, if we do not have a reliable canon that delivers to us the truth of God revealed in Israel, the Israel, the Church, and above all, the person and work of Jesus Christ, then we should give this up. We should be done. <laughs> um, this is why I, I think that um, that's the answer. This is the explanation. So I will allow myself to be long-winded again. Um, <laughs> uh, this, is why, this is why the Radical Reformation view, uh, the Yodarian view, the, the, the low church, I call it small b Baptist or believer's church view, uh, is fundamentally wrong, at least on this issue. It, it's a fun, I'll put it this way. It's, it's, it's fundamentally wrong in its in its historicism in its way of narrating the history and tradition of the church it simply cannot be the case that the church unchurches itself as early as possible whether in the year 150 or 350 or 550 and then it takes 1000 to 1200 to 1400 to 1600 years for someone to wake up and realize the problem well that means the church has not been extant for one or two millennia i, do, I mean this is this is an impossible conclusion it, do, it doesn't That's a pretty get big you insult to god it is. Hey, it, you established it, this church, but it failed for most yeah, of the time. The gates of hell should not prevail against it, except for the fifteen hundred year interim when it does. Right. Except for most that, of human history. Yeah. That's that's not going to work. Um, and so that's why uh, that historiography. I said historicism. It's really a, a, a mode of historiography, a kind of Christian um, uh, historiography of a climactic epochal fall, the fall of the church, whether it's in. 1350, 1150, 750, 3. And, and the thing is about this historiography, it always generates earlier dates. 
So by the time we get to the 18 and early 1900s in Germany, you have scholars saying, no, it's actually present in the New Testament. So we get rid of the Catholic epistles because they sound too, too patristic. Um, and so we're just going to focus on these Pauline texts, but not all the Pauline texts, only seven of them. And of the seven, maybe two and a half. Uh, and the Gospels are written later, so we can kind of, you know, throw those away too. So really, we've got two and a half letters from Paul that hold are the on, real Gospel. So, so th th there are people who are Christians who say that the church ceased to be the church during the time period that the New Testament was still being written. Well, uh, they wouldn't frame it from the perspective of the church because they've already given up any high claims of ecclesiology. They would say rather that the true gospel was lost because it was corrupted oh by it was corrupted by um, uh, you know folks. You just the, the exact same story you tell about medieval popes or about Saint Augustine or Constantine or whomever. You just apply that to James or Jude or first and second Peter, or if pa some of Paul's letters are Deuteropauline, then, then to Paul's heirs and developers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, or the writers of the gospels. You just keep playing that same game until you whittle down, you whittle it all down till there's nothing left. So this is, this is kind of a, a thing that that's associated with that you're we we can all pretty well agree i feel like I, I feel like we should at least all agree there's this really extreme side of the spectrum where you can say the church is so narrow by its ethics that you know nobody's gonna believe that it has to be like we're the the amish community or, or like some you know particular community is the only right church. Uh, that that pretty well is self-defeating in the context of a divided, globalized Christianity. Um, not many people are going to believe that. But there are going to be people who use that same logic to talk about how um, our, our faithfulness within the church does um, include us or exclude us from the church. That, that you can be the church in your baptism, then you can be unfaithful and you can stop being the church. And then you can be faithful and now you're at the church again, but you don't need to be baptized again. And what I, and this is something, this is the Ephraim Radner in the back of my head, you know, um, and the big question that I have for you, and maybe this gets inside of your, your Robert Jensen that you've talked about, your, um, the church, you know, through time, um, what is the church? That's your question. What is the church? That is my question. What is the church? What is the what is this thing? When we say the church, what are we even talking about? Because you've mentioned the Catholics, and the Catholics have a ground. So should I go convert to Catholicism? But wait, you said the church is divided, but the church is the body of Christ. The Catholics and the Orthodox say that that's sinless, therefore it can't be divided. So there's one church, and it's undivided. And I meant say the Catholics and say the ref us and say the orthodox so like how do you how what is the church and how can this thing even be divided and this is this is really the Ephraim radner question um but i think it's it's behind everything that you're saying so i'd like to just sort of call it out yeah um i think i'm not going to be answering your question because i think you're asking a different question and i don't think i quite understand it but the you know i think all of the you know, there are some theological questions that require like a level of depth or sophistication or subtlety based on reading the tradition, you know, close attention to scripture, etc. And then there are other theological questions where like my six year old has the right answer. Uh, like it's not something that need, you sort of need all this years and years of training. The church is the people of God. The church is the body of Christ. The church is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The church is the family of Abraham. Uh, the church is... Uh, uh, that community of people across time and across the world, uh, united united to those who've gone on, uh, the communion of saints, united to those who will come, uh, past and present, um, un you know, whether separated by time or space, uh, who belong to um, God's election in virtue of their descent from Abraham or their baptism and adoption into the family of Abraham. And God has called this people out of the world, uh, out of love, 
uh, so that he might form a people for himself and to make known to the world uh, who he is and what he and his will for the world. That's what the that's what the church is. Um, that raises the question of church division and how it can be possible that the one holy Catholic and apostolic church is somehow divided. So I'll say two things about that, something brief and then something that gets back to a question you asked uh, a bit ago. And, you know, you were referring to like the, the Catholic view, but, you know, go go read Joseph Ratzinger, the Pope Emeritus. He has really moving reflections he, mm-hmm. that he wrote before becoming Pope, but he was very high up in the Vatican about um, he didn't view the Orthodox uh, or even Protestants as kind of schismatics or heretics to be spurned. And if they only came to what Catholics know to be the truth, then all would be well. Mm. What he, the way he understood the Reformation and church division in the present is twofold. One, that church division is a kind of wound in the body of Christ. And what we are praying to the Spirit to give us is healing of those wounds, whether in our lifetimes or uh, in the future. And only the Spirit can do that. So that's why we beg the Spirit to bring that that unity and healing. And then um, second, um, he, he, he describes the Reformation as a Felix culpa, uh, a kind of happy fault by which he means not that it was good, and of course he, he's going to be on the Catholic side of that, but he understands that there were abuses and corruptions to which faithful Christians were responding and desiring for reform. And he says, if in God's providence this is the rebuke of the, the one people of God, that God in his wisdom um, willed for his people, that will in God's providential grace eventually lead to greater unity and reform, whether that's in 50 years, 500 years, mm-hmm. or 5,000 years, then so be it. It's it's akin to the fall, which in the medieval hymn says, uh, O Felix Culpa, uh, O happy fault that, that merited a salvation as great as the one that I have. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's quite that's quite beautiful to hear the the man who who would become pope uh, say that, and I think that's the right perspective for all of us to take about uh, uh, to take on the phenomenon or reality of a church as divided as it is today. So then, the second thing I want to say in, is, uh, you asked me earlier, uh, and I never got around to it about the sort of three the typology, the three types of churches that I sketch out in um, in my book, and very briefly. Though I call those the the small C Catholic Church, the small R Reformed Church, and the small B Baptist or Believers Church, and what I mean by those, I'm trying to um, group the divided communions in a way that gives us some handle on them, and I do so by family resemblance. And the small C Catholic types are not just Roman Christians, but also Eastern Orthodox Christians, as well as uh, many Anglican Christians. And you put those three together and you've already got two thirds of the world Christians together. Right. Um, and <clears throat> also that you, you could include the the separated churches of the East um, who divided over uh, Chalcedon um, in the fifth century. And then second, you have churches that uh, claim warrant and um, um progenitors in the Protestant Reformation, um, folks who look to Luther or Calvin or Bucer, uh, or later to someone like John Wesley. Um, so I have in mind Presbyterians and Lutherans and um, Methodists and so on. These are folks who value tradition, who say the creed, who have a liturgy, who ordain pastors, um, but are trying to strike a kind of via media, a middle way between sort of high church, small C Catholic, and low church, small B believers church or Baptist church. And then the third is that is that last group. Think evangelicalism, think restoration movement, think churches of Christ, think Baptists, think non-denom, think even charismatics. Uh, these are churches who, who often don't ordain, who don't have structures of authority or centralization, uh, who lack any sense of sacred tradition often lack a high sense of the sacraments, uh, uh, are often congregationalist, autonomous, um, often, um, in America at least, the prov- products of kind of frontier revival or entrepreneurial religion. Um, and those are the three types or, or ways of being, doing, and thinking church that I identify and try to sketch out uh, in my book and that I always have in the back of my mind as kind of the three main families, even though they're not all necessarily blood relations. Hmm. 
So, okay. So here's, I kind of want to, I kind of want to ask this just because there's this unsettled part in me, but right after it, I want to, I want to finish with, um, talking about the ends of scripture. Um, we, we are running short on time and I don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, so let me just ask if I were, can, can, can the church, like the baptized, exit the church, become not the church? So that's the part of your question that I wasn't sure where you, what you're getting at. It sounds to me like you're asking about the possibility of mortal sin, but I, but it doesn't seem like that's what you're asking about. No, I mean, not, I would put not it, mortal sin necessarily. It's, it's a um, question of my corporate identity. How do we identify? And this is Ephraim Radner's thing in his book on church. Um, and the reason I'm asking it is because if we if we say that we become part of the church, but we exit the church by our faithfulness, not that our eternal destinies aren't impacted, um, you know, by our faithfulness or unfaithfulness, like they are, they are. But like, if I do the first Corinthians five sin, you know, of like that guy got delivered unto Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that in the day of the Lord, he might be saved. Um, if I lose my identity as the church in that, then that could have happened logically to, you know, all the Christians who aren't part of uh, the, the main, you know, branches of the church who don't have a recognized baptism. Um, and so they wouldn't be part of the church and the church wouldn't be divided. Um, it would just be, there's the one church, and then there's the the not church. And so this is this is something that that Radner sort of talks about. Maybe I'm getting off topic. Um, I guess uh, so yeah, maybe it might be too far afield, but I think yeah. I think there there have to be a lot of there have to be parameters and definitions to make that question answerable because, Everybody agrees you that that there is um, a limit to being church that that you can be heretical um, that a, that that both a member of the church can be heretical, but also that churches as a whole. So think of Jehovah's Witness, which deny the divinity of Christ, um, uh, or or think of uh, or think sort of like one step removed, or then one step removed, or then one step removed. Um, everyone thinks, uh, no matter how high church, low church, of the three types I was describing, everybody agrees there are uh, doctrinal and liturgical boundaries. Um, so I, I, ta- I guess I take that as given that everybody everybody agrees mm-hmm. on that. That there can be a commu- there can be communities that say we are church that are not in fact church. Uh, I, t- I take that as given. So. Um, at initially, that's what, the reason why I was pointing to mortal sin is because it sounded like you were talking about individuals and virtue of moral failings. Can they can they unchurch themselves? But that's I take that to be a another a sort of different another a distinct question, and then a third distinct question about sort of the validity of baptism. But the thing about that is that actually the sort of highest of high churches, uh, Orthodox, Anglican, and Roman, recognize the validity of any baptism. Uh, done in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, you know, done with the intention of the church. Uh, I mean, you're not, you don't, you can't be play acting or mocking. But um, whereas there are lots of low, medium, and low churches that actually would rebaptize you if you were baptized by one of the mm-hmm. high churches or another church. So I, I think that that view of baptism is the baptism is the right one. If if anyone on this earth is baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, um, uh, with water. Uh, then, then they um, they have been uh, grafted in. They've been adopted into the family of Abraham, and therefore the family of God. Uh, what their status is, whether salvific or ecclesial, fo- uh, you know, following that baptism, I think then becomes uh, an intelligible question. Okay, okay, and that was 
something that was in the back of my head. You've talked about the church as the baptized several points inside of your, uh, several times within your works. And um, maybe it, maybe this is me picking on my hobby horse right now. I have a bad habit of doing that. So I apologize if this was off topic. Um, I wanted to get to uh, this one last thing before we um, ask our final question that we'll try to ask in all of our interviews. Um, but you, you talk in your book, The Doctrine of Scripture, which, by the way, for anybody who's like hearing this and you're like, I'm not tracking, go read his book because it is super readable. It's, it's like devouring, I don't know, just above popular level poetry, and it's all about doctrine that you can actually understand when you read it. It's really, really well written. Um, Thank you. But it's, it's good. I've never read that. I wrote my thesis and it was garbage. And then I read your stuff and it was like, man, I wish I could talk like this. <laughs> you are right to recommend that one. It's it's both half the length of the other one and more readable. So if anyone did want to start with one, that would be the one. Oh, it's it's really good. But you talk inside of it that the, the scripture has particular ends. It has a, a telos. It's directed towards something. So through Christ, scripture acts as savior, teacher, archetype, and lover. Um, and you say that scripture's end is befriending Christ, it, beatitude, conversion, following Christ, instruction, edification, imaging Christ, sanctification, perseverance, and knowing Christ, communion, and contemplative delight. And I think so many of us miss this, that scripture doesn't exist just to exist, but it has a purpose um, and that purpose, and I just want to rant for just a little bit. I'm quoting you right now, so it's vicariously you talking. Um, but you say inside of your book this, this amazing point about reading the Bible in prayer, that to read the Bible without prayer is an exercise in missing the point, a contradiction in terms. It is as if one were to chew one's food without swallowing it or start one's car without putting it into drive. It involves a wholesale failure to see the thing for what it is, to engage with it on its own terms, to put it to use for its own ends. Such things can be done, but they make very little sense, and they performatively contradict the very object of their work and affection. Um, what my final, my final before our final question, which, you know, is um, why, how, how does the scripture having ends affect the way that we approach it as in the act of interpretation, but also in just like our demeanor towards scripture itself. Yeah. I'm glad you, glad you picked up on that. That's, that, that's sort of, that's the chapter where I let my freak flag fly a little bit um, <laughs> and just kind of rhapsodize poetically about scripture. Um, yeah. What I'm wanting to do there is to reframe um, in particular for bible Christians, bible traditions, um, I think the, the practices that those traditions inculcate in lay people are wonderful, but the end or ends that they lay before those practices or in front of those practices um, are in, at, at, at best incomplete, uh, at worst, um, harmful is way too strong, but not, not good. They don't, they don't conduce to the, they don't conduct people to the right things. And what do I mean by that? I mean that far too often, uh, uh, ordinary believers in the pews can think that the Bible exists to get things right. And I'm the one who has to get those things right by reading. <laughs> and that is just wrong. Um, that's not that's not what the Bible is there for, and it's certainly not what it's there for for you. <laughs> um, rather, and what I try to spell out in that chapter is the Bible has many ends, and that's one of the things I'm trying to do. It's 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 pluriform. It's got lots of things that it can do for you that God wants to use. Uh, lots of ways God wants to use it in your life um, for you, but ultimately, the Bible is about God, and uh, the Bible, the Bible's purpose in your life when you hear it in church and when you read it devotionally is to um is to draw you 
in contemplative wonder and delight at the God who speaks to you in and through this text. It is meant for fellowship and union. And I, 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 what I do at the end of the chapter, as you know, is I use the Song of Songs as the kind of holy of holies within Scripture that show us what the Bible is for. What it's for is delight, communion, friendship, relationship, marriage, even a kind of conjugal union, right? This is something we shouldn't shy away from. The Bible loves to talk about sexual union as a paradigm or blueprint or analogy for our union with God and Christ. And that's what the Bible is meant to mediate. It's meant to draw us towards God in joy and fellowship and love and pleasure. And so we should, we should, um, chew and suck on the morsels, the treats, the Turkish delight of scripture, um, rather than seeing it as this jumble of ancient texts by ancient people in an ancient language in a place I've never visited a long time ago. And I guess I've got to figure out this history book. Well, that's just a recipe for um, dissatisfaction and feeling alienated from the text rather than the living God is speaking to me through this because he loves me and he wants to use the words on this very page to draw me into himself in a process that will not be complete until uh, the life of the world to come. Um, that's what the Bible's for. Uh, and and if you approach it that way, then you're not thinking like, well, I forgot what a Sadducee is or like, when when is when is Joel written? You know, like, I guess I need to look at my study notes. Like, it's not that there's no place for that, but that makes it more like you're in a classroom rather than um, rather than a meeting between lovers. Uh, and, and I think the latter is a much better a much better model for how to uh, to draw near to God through Scripture. That made me want to go read your book. That was really good. Yeah, that was that was awesome. <laughs> you know how like Ian and I we've we've talked about like we want to take a little blurb or something like that and put it at the, the intro yeah. of the, yeah that would be the intro of the episode. Yeah. That would just be like the intro of every episode. That would just draw people in. It wouldn't be in any of the later things. It'd just be there, and they'd be like, "Oh man, I gotta wait for this part. When's it coming?" This well, doesn't I, even I know, sound like the guy we're talking to. I know, Alec. You have your final question. Is it okay if I ask? One last thing before that. Yeah, yeah. So I we've said a lot um, throughout this this podcast. We've talked about a lot of different things. We've gone deep in ways that might be difficult for people who are just entry level in this to understand. So I want to give you the length of a TikTok video to answer three questions. What is the church? I don't, well, I don't even know the length of a TikTok. I, I don't know, like, like like a minute or something, like like very very brief. Like okay. Google's say, just say gonna it, hang up on us. If you say TikTok like... again, I'm signing off. Just to be clear. So okay. <laughs> see, I told you, man. I told you. You have I don't, the, I don't uh, do TikTok, short I elevator just, I ride. A fun way to... Everyone does yeah. the elevator pitch. I wanted to say it differently. So yeah, no, we I'm were, just kidding. Ian and I were talking right. about this the other day, and I saw your Aveline interview, and I was like, maybe we shouldn't say TikTok. That might set him off. <laughs> it's a personal affront. If you want to get me get me hot and bothered, then yeah, say that one more time, and I'll go off on a tangent. No, no, no. Yeah. Go ahead. So you got the length of a short video to answer three questions. What is the Bible? What is the church? How are they connected? The Bible uh, is the word of God for the people of God. Um, and the church is the people of God who hears uh, the living God speak uh, to it through uh, the words of Scripture in the context, in the principle, principally in the context of the Eucharistic liturgy, i.e., uh, in the context of the gathered people of God in assembly on the Lord's Day, Sunday morning, to pray, to sing, um, to commune at the Lord's table in the body and blood of Christ, to hear the word of God proclaimed by um, pastor or preacher, and to hear uh, God himself address his own people in his own words through the embassy of his prophets and apostles, that is, his servants. Um, and that's how they're that's how they're connected. The, the, the church feeds on the living word that is Christ in the verbal bread of uh of the Bible and in the, uh, and in the bread of the Eucharist, that these, these are the two ways that, uh, Christ feeds his people, uh, with his word in the, in the language of uh, St. Augustine and Luther and others. Um, the Bible is the, is the audible word 
of God and the Eucharist or, or Holy Communion is the visible word of God. And these are the two ways through our ears and through our mouths that we receive uh, uh, what, what Jesus refers to, right? Uh, what, what do we need to live on? Uh, nothing so much as uh, every word that comes from the mouth of God. Thank you so much. Our final question, is there anything that we didn't ask that you wish we would have asked you? Not at all. Um, no, this, I would say this was a very comprehensive conversation. Yeah, it was. And it was awesome. And we have really enjoyed having you on. Um, every nerd part of me is just so ecstatic and thankful. Uh, we really appreciate what, um, what you've written. I, I, oh man, that book, your book has like been the nail in the coffin for me on so many issues with this. And it's shown me where I'm wrong in several ways. Even this interview, you've shown me where I'm wrong in several ways and I love it. (laughs) Um, appreciate you so much. And yeah, thank y'all for having me on. Closing us out. Would you be willing to pray for us and have the final word in prayer? Happy to. Yeah. Let's pray. Thank you. Oh God, we give you thanks for this day. Thank you for uh, this season of Advent. Ask that you'd prepare our hearts and minds uh, uh, to welcome you uh, into our homes and into our lives and in the, in the bir- remembering the birth of your son as we look forward to uh, his return soon and very soon. God, I thank you for these, uh, these two guys and pray that you bless their work. Pray that in all that we do, uh, your son would be glorified. In his name we pray. Amen.